I'm in a vegetative state, but I got married to the daughter of the Lu family. All because I accidentally got her pregnant. When everyone thought I would cling to my wife's status, I left resolutely because of a birthday wish my daughter made. Chapter 1 I handed the divorce papers to Willow. She just glanced at me indifferently, like she was looking at a stranger. In five years of marriage, we never shared a bed since the wedding day. We slept separately and rarely even ate together. Despite this, she pretended to be a loving wife in public, showing off our supposed affection. I am a legal advisor at the Lou Group, while she is the heiress, Willow. In a novel, I would be the typical live-in son-in-law of a wealthy family. But our marriage wasn't due to a great debt the Lou family owed mine, nor because we were deeply in love, nor a parental agreement. It was merely an accident. Because of this, I endured the cold stares of my father-in-law and brother-in-law. They treated me with disdain both at home and at work, acting as if I was a dog they didn't need to feed, but I tolerated it until today because of that accident. Willow's eyes were cold and distant. She said blandly, George, do you think I would never divorce you? Talking about personal matters during work hours, that's an $1,800 fine. She was certain I wasn't genuinely seeking a divorce but merely pressuring her. Her distant gaze reminded me of that afternoon long ago. Three months into my job, my boss targeted me several times because I unknowingly took a position he wanted for his candidate. He berated me for my writing style differences. Frustrated, I went to the corner of the company courtyard to smoke. That's where I met Willow. She was stunning. In a black fitted dress, her hair swayed gently in the breeze. Her features were fresh and elegant. Her red lips parted under a high nose. And her eyes, beneath thick lashes, were like a spring pool. As I approached, I smelled a faint floral scent. Despite her beauty, she was crying against the wall. I exhaled deeply and impulsively patted her shoulder. She looked up at me, startled, her teary eyes shining. I sympathized deeply, saying, Did you get scolded too? Let me tell you, the higher-ups here are all brainless. Why get mad at idiots? She frowned and asked, Are they all like this? Of course, I replied. Let me explain. I smoked while naming and cursing all the leaders I knew for ten minutes, venting my anger. Then I added, If the company keeps running like this, it'll be doomed. Don't be sad. Curse them too. Every employee curses their boss. You'll feel better. If not, lean on my shoulder. To my surprise, she leaned on my shoulder, finding solace. Her hair brushed my cheek, fragrant. I felt her breathing, initially rapid, gradually calming. My heart pounded as if shocked by electricity, unable to calm down. I thought it was a beautiful afternoon, but then she got up, smiled, and pointed to my badge, saying, George, right, slacking off and smoking during work hours, that's an $1,800 fine. Later, I learned she cried because of Makoto, but I had already fallen deeply in love with her. Willow never liked me from the start, it was always Makoto, so I didn't bother arguing. Find me, let her, I said. Willow, I want a divorce, as soon as possible. Willow finally glanced at the papers and said, George, if you want to trick me, at least make a real divorce agreement. Only compensation. Willow didn't know the amount matched what her father once offered to make me leave her, but I stayed because I am a transmigrator completing missions to wake up from a vegetative state. After meeting her, the system told me the mission, marry Willow and have a child. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't warm her heart. We have no future. This money is a belated compensation. I don't want to argue. The 50 million in the agreement is a negotiable amount for the Lou family and a fortune for me. Enough for a luxurious life. Willow stood up, looking at me disdainfully in her expensive designer chiffon dress, and sneered. You didn't even write about our daughter's custody. What? You don't want your precious daughter anymore. I smiled faintly. No. Chapter 2. I used to love Anna Wong very much. As an orphan since childhood, without parents or siblings, only my shadow accompanied me. I didn't understand the meaning of family until I first held Anna in my arms. Seeing her tiny face and feeling her warmth, my heart melted. This feeling filled my soul, completing a missing part of me. Every smile, every glance from her brought me immense happiness, making me feel I finally had a family. Someone worth protecting with my life. I gave all the affection I lacked in my childhood to Anna. I was incredibly protective of her. She was my only blood relative. So if I didn't cherish her, who would? But Willow had no feelings for Anna. Since Anna was an unexpected pregnancy, so Willow's contempt for me also transferred to Anna. When the doctor placed Anna beside her after birth, she merely glanced and turned away, saying, She looks like George. Then she left Anna for me to take care of. Her mother didn't love her. So I played both father and mother. People say daughters are like little jackets to their fathers. I never received familial love and wouldn't let my daughter miss out either. For five years, I poured all my patience and love into every stage of her growth. Strangely, Anna adored Willow. She had a talent for languages. At just three, she coldly said to me, Mom doesn't spend time with me because it's your fault, Dad. I took it as childish talk. At four, 
She met Makoto, who had returned from abroad after his divorce. She told the nanny. No wonder mom likes Makoto. I like him too. Uncle Makoto is much better than dad. He's handsome and rich. Always buys me lots of treats. Unlike dad, who never lets me eat anything fun. Just because I wouldn't let her have too many sweets. She pouted angrily. I overheard her complaints from the kitchen. Suppressing my discomfort, I gently said, Anna, daddy will make you new candy. Daddy made them himself. Pear and hawthorn candy. Delicious and healthy. But she grabbed the candy I made and threw it into the trash can. Shouting, I don't want your garbage. I want the fancy candy Uncle Makoto brought from Italy. I want cavities. So what? I stared at her, stunned. At that moment, I realized how much Willow's daughter resembled her. Both unresponsive to my warmth, especially on her fifth birthday. Both mother and daughter invited Makoto. While lighting the candles, I suddenly heard the long absent voice of the system. Host, long time no see. I'm back. Although others couldn't hear it, I instinctively stepped outside. Host, your mission is complete. You have enough points to return. You can also choose to stay. After all, you have a family now. In the original world, you were all alone. As I hesitated, Anna made the decision for me. Just as I stepped back into the hall, I heard her birthday wish. Her voice was clear and loud, without any regard for me. Can mom and dad divorce? I want Uncle Makoto to be my dad. Everyone was stunned. Willow just frowned slightly and said, Make another wish. Makoto teased her. You can't say that. Did you get your dad's permission to switch dads? You'll get a spanking. But his eyes were filled with undisguised pride. I smiled. Turning to the system, I said, Take me home. I don't want to wait another second. Chapter 3 But the system gave me bad news. Since the central system has received too many second and third time transmigrators, there's now a cooling off period for leaving the system. I was stunned. The system cleared its throat and said, Just like your human divorce cooling off period, you need to wait. I blurted out, Wait for what? Damn it. The system reminded me to use civilized language, so I restrained myself and asked, How long? Three years. Three years. System, are you kidding? Wait until all the vegetables in your garden wither. The system paused for a moment and said, Host, your insults are quite sophisticated. After three seconds of silence, it continued, as compensation for my long absence, I'll increase your points by one third, so when you wake up from your vegetative state, your body will be completely healthy, fine, then I'll finalize the divorce first, that's why I was standing in Willow's office, Willow, let's get a divorce, Willow looked up, staring straight into my eyes, and asked mockingly, George, have you forgotten, who was the one who begged me five years ago to have Anna, saying if I didn't, he would die, those were my words, that year. Willow heard the news of Makoto's marriage. She drank all night and, in her heartbreak, came to me. She said, George, look at me. Why am I not good enough for Makoto? Why did he marry someone else? If he can marry another woman, I can find another man. George, you like me, don't you? You've waited for me, right? I nodded. We kissed passionately. That night, despite precautions, she accidentally became pregnant with Anna. Her first reaction was to have an abortion because she didn't want a child to be a burden if Makoto came back for her. The child would be an obstacle between them. But then the system spoke. If you abort now, it means mission failure, and you know the consequences. Host, I begged Willow. Driven by the system and my own deep desires, I said, if the baby dies, so will I. I swear I'll take care of both of you for life. Without my plea, Anna would never have been born. Willow didn't care about me, didn't care about Anna. She only cared about one person, Makoto who had lived with her in the orphanage and saved her. Willow always wanted to marry just one person, Makoto. The day her biological father took her from the orphanage, she cried and begged Makoto to wait for her to marry him. So, she always held on to her feelings for Makoto. However, the next news she got about him was his marriage. Much later, I learned that. Willow agreed to my proposal and decided to keep the child not because she believed my words, but because of something Makoto said. He told her, Willow, why do you think you deserve me to wait for you forever? Chapter 4. I looked at Willow's beautiful face, but I was thinking. I hope I never see her again, I said calmly, since both you and your daughter like Makoto. After the divorce, you can form a family. Everyone will be happy, right? Willow smiled at me, but I could see the disdain and arrogance beneath her smile. She said, George, aren't you hypocritical? Do you think this will make me beg you? You really disgust me. Also, the child is mine. You tricked me into having her. From the moment you tried to threaten me with divorce, you completely lost your right to be a father. So, if you want me to sign the divorce papers, it's simple, you must promise never to come near my daughter again, never to see her. In the past, this would have been a fatal blow to me, because love makes one vulnerable. After all, she is my only relative, my only daughter. But now, 
I don't care about anyone, so I have no vulnerabilities. Under her contemptuous gaze, I replied calmly, fine. She was taken aback, her eyes darkening. She grabbed a pen and quickly signed the agreement. Then she threw a copy at me. I picked it up and turned to leave. Willow bit her lip and said, George, take your lies and get far away. Never come back, I said. Fine. My emotions were frighteningly steady, but then I paused and smiled, asking her. We haven't received the divorce certificate yet, and you haven't paid the compensation. I won't leave. Please pay in advance. Thank you. Willow's face turned red, reluctantly. She signed a check. Chapter 5. Watching George leave the office without looking back. Willow felt an inexplicable panic. Just then, Secretary Chin walked in with some documents. She had been with Willow for many years, both a subordinate and a close friend. She said, Willow, is George asking for a divorce? Willow nodded without replying. Taking the documents somewhat despondently, the secretary smiled and said, It's just a quarrel. George won't really divorce. George loves you and the child so much. How could he bear to leave you? Willow frowned slightly and said, Whether he leaves or not, he has no right to show me attitude. Everything he has is because of the Lu family. If he really wants a divorce, I'll make Anna change her surname to Lu. Secretary Chin smiled, put down the documents, and left. The office suddenly became eerily quiet. For some reason, she kept recalling George's departing figure, which felt unfamiliar. It wasn't the George she remembered. She inexplicably recalled that night, for the first time under him. Willow felt nervous and scared, her eyes red, her voice trembling. George had said things she didn't understand. He said, Willow, I'm not just here to conquer you, I genuinely like you, otherwise, I wouldn't be doing this with you. Willow, I'll stay here, treat you well, please treat me well too, okay. Though she didn't understand, she inexplicably felt at ease, no longer scared. She intertwined her fingers with his and kissed him. Over the years, George was always gentle and considerate. The only thing that disgusted her was forcing her to keep the child, ruining her future with Makoto. He absurdly said, if the child is gone, the mission will fail, and I won't exist. She had to retaliate against him. So, for five years, she never showed him a good face. After all, he was homeless and would stay with her till death. His wish echoed in her ears again. Willow, I want a cute child, the three of us living in a cozy home. Okay. No, she never wanted a family. She never had one since childhood. Her father only found her to use her as a pawn in marriage alliances. Unable to marry Makoto, she married a low-level employee, but she would never follow her father's arrangements. The day George asked for a divorce, she couldn't stay at the office and went home early. Where is George? The nanny whispered. Sir moved out this afternoon. Willow felt even more panicked inside but didn't show it. She just sneered. He's quite convincing. Then she walked into her bedroom, ignoring everything else. Chapter 6 After getting the divorce agreement, I returned home. I packed a few things and was ready to leave. Anna was sitting in the living room, playing on her tablet, with a candy in her mouth. Colorful wrappers were scattered all over the floor. She glanced at me and said flatly, Mom allows me to eat these. Uncle Makoto gave them to me, so mind your own business. I smiled, I won't mind at all. You can eat a hundred if you like. I squatted down and pinched her cheek. If you get cavities, it's your problem, not mine. Anna, I'm leaving. Where to? To make room for your new dad. I won't come back here anymore. Anna frowned, her expression just like her mother's. Dad, you're talking nonsense. Mom says you're an orphan, and without clinging to her, you have nowhere else to go. Dad, you're so useless. As a dad, you're such a failure. No one in this family likes you or needs you. Uncle Makoto would never be so pathetic, always working or circling around the child at home. It's so annoying. Dad, you should leave. I won't miss you. Then she lowered her head and continued playing her game, watching her indifferent back. If it were before, I would have been extremely hurt before. I would often ask her carefully what she was playing, if she would teach me, if I could play with her. I, a grown man, played girls' games, tea parties, and role-playing, sacrificing so much time just to spend time with her, but all I got in return was her disdain. Any slight disagreement led to her tantrums and sulking. Now, I don't care anymore. Whoever wants to care can go ahead. All right, Anna, I hope you can keep that tough mouth of yours. With that, I dragged my suitcase out the door. The warm sunlight stung my eyes. A phrase flashed in my mind, live towards the sun. Chapter 7. Since I only had to wait three years, I quit my job, took the compensation, and settled down, renting an apartment in a nice community. No need to buy. I couldn't take it with me after three years anyway. The community was beautiful, and from my window, I could see the sea, but I could also see people walking into the sea. A little boy, alone, slowly approached the waves. Instinctively, I ran downstairs in my slippers crossed a road and a green belt to the beach. 
I picked up the little guy. Where are your parents? The boy was about three years old, with big, round eyes like grapes. His eyes were wet, as if he had just cried, but he didn't say a word, just tightly clutched his clothes. Daniel, a woman walked over, her long hair flowing like a waterfall in the sea breeze. She had a fresh, natural look with a gentle smile. I hadn't noticed her earlier, sitting on a hammock under a tree, watching him. Thank you, but don't worry, he wouldn't dare go further. I was watching. The woman approached to take the boy. Daniel, come home with mommy. But the boy clung to my pants, with his chubby mouth. He said, hug. The woman was surprised and smiled. This is the first time Daniel has asked a stranger to hug him. I rubbed the little guy's head. Since I had nothing better to do, I carried him back to the community. It turned out they lived next door. The woman thought for a moment and said, Mr. Wong, Daniel seems to like you. I know you're single and currently not working. It's just me and my son. I'm a doctor, and I often bake. If you're willing, I quickly handed the boy back. I interrupted her, saying, Miss, if you're interested in me, just say it. You look like a model with your height and long legs, and your fair skin and beauty make you look like a celebrity. Why are you acting like a stalker? How did you find out so much about me? She looked stunned and said, Mr. Wong, I wanted to ask if you could help look after Daniel for a while. I just fired his nanny for mistreating him, and I need someone to watch him until I find a new nanny. I saw how you cared for children, so I thought I'd ask. I can make you some treats in return. I was speechless. What a misunderstanding. But then I thought again and asked, How did you find out so much about me? She said, Well, I know your information because I'm your landlord. After confirming her identity, it was true. I felt so embarrassed, but I'm someone who can admit mistakes and adapt, so I said, Miss Landlord, I apologize for being creepy. Okay, Chapter 8, Regarding Her Request, I considered it for a moment and planned to refuse. After all, taking care of children is troublesome. I used to take care of Anna because I was her biological father. I wanted to make up for my own unfulfilled experiences, filling the void in my heart by taking care of her. But now, taking care of another child is something I cannot do. Kids at this age love to run around and I can't afford to take responsibility if something happens. However, in the next second, she said, you can name your price. So I said, sure, sister, when do I start? There was no helping it. The child's pitiful eyes were too hard to refuse, and I couldn't bear to turn down such a lonely mother and son. Unlike my daughter, he was very quiet and didn't talk much. I took care of him with the same dedication and effort as I did my daughter. So he often sat obediently on his little stool, watching me play video games. Every time I won, he clapped his little hands and praised me. He said, Brother Wong is amazing. Brother Wong is the best. Brother Wong dominates the game. Sarah looked on speechlessly. I explained to her that I had him call me Brother Wong because it's better to be friends with kids, not enemies. Daniel chimed in. Brother Wong is my best friend. Mom, don't worry. I'll take care of him. You go to work. Sometimes, while playing, I would zone out for a moment. Anna never did this. She always complained. Dad, this is boring. Draw me a picture. Dad. Your drawing is ugly. I don't like it. This isn't what I wanted. Then she tore up the little hamster I had spent half an hour drawing for her. Daniel, on the other hand, was a much easier child to get along with. The only strange thing about him was that he often called out for his parents in his sleep. He woke up with his eyes wet. Every time, I would wipe away his tears. He would look at me, embarrassed, and say, Mom always says boys shouldn't cry. Am I being silly? And I would tell him, Everyone gets sad, and when you're sad, you cry. If happiness doesn't distinguish between genders, neither does crying. After saying that, I would give him a pear and hawthorn lollipop I made. He would put it in his mouth, and his eyes would squint into crescent moons with satisfaction. He would give me a fruity kiss. When his mom Sarah came home from work, he would show off. Mom, Brother Wong's candy is much better than yours. Sometimes, he would be reluctant to finish it all at once, taking small bites slowly. I laughed. Eat up, Daniel, if you like it. I'll make more. But don't forget to brush your teeth. The things Anna despised were treasures to someone else. Before the divorce, my life revolved around Anna. Even with a nanny at home, I would worry every half hour at work about whether Anna had hurt herself. Maybe it was because I had Daniel's company. During these days apart, I rarely thought about Anna or anything related to Willow. Instead, the butler contacted me several times. Miss Anna isn't used to sleeping without your bedtime stories. She'll get used to it. Miss Anna has a toothache. Will you come back to be with her? No, I'm not a dentist. Chapter 9. A few days later, I unexpectedly ran into Anna. Sarah went out of town for a conference and asked me to pick up and drop off Daniel for a few days. But I overlooked the fact that Daniel's new kindergarten was the same as Anna's. I carried Daniel out of the car and just dropped him off. Then I ran into Anna. Willow, with a cold expression, was still sitting in the car. Anna opened her mouth, 
wanting to call out dad, but the words stuck in her throat. Even though we were divorced, she was still my daughter, a familiar face. So I greeted her, hey, Anna, but she didn't respond. Running into the classroom like an angry pufferfish, the woman in the car, my ex-wife Willow, was also a familiar face, but I had no intention of greeting her. Unexpectedly, she spoke first. George, didn't you firmly agree not to see Anna anymore? It's only been a few days, and you can't hold back. I laughed angrily and said, are you crazy? Does your family own this kindergarten? You can come, but I can't. As if I wanted to see you, why don't you just transfer her to another school tomorrow? I couldn't be bothered with her. Willow scoffed behind me. George, keep pretending. Chapter 10. George had been away for over a month. Willow didn't understand. Such an ordinary man. A substitute. Someone dispensable. Why did the house feel so empty without him? Anna often cried. She clung to the housekeeper, asking, when will dad come home? She couldn't quite figure out her feelings for Anna. Maybe it was because she was abandoned by a garbage dump as a child. So, she didn't know how to be a mother to a child. Stop crying. You look ugly when you cry. Anna hiccuped through her tears. Mom, can you tell me a bedtime story? No, you don't have to sleep if you don't want to. Anna was taken aback. In the end, Willow sat by Anna's little bed and told her a story. The more Willow read, the more frustrated she felt. She should be getting her beauty sleep. Why was she sitting here reading a children's book? With a snap, she closed the book. Lights off. Sleep or don't. I don't care. Anyway, she wasn't going to keep reading. Anna pouted but reluctantly slid under the covers. For the first time, Willow felt a bit unsettled since George left. This frustration stayed with her until she saw him at Anna's kindergarten a few days later. The annoyance in her heart seemed to lessen a bit. She thought, how could he leave his daughter? She was his only family, and he purposely picked the rare time she brought Anna to school. He was just stubborn and prideful. He could have had a good life but insisted on a divorce. So she took Anna out of school, not letting her go to kindergarten. She wanted George to make a wasted trip. Want to see the child? Fine. Come and beg her. But three days later, Butler Zhang hesitantly said, Sir still goes to kindergarten every day. It seems he's taking someone else's child to school. He hasn't specifically come to see Miss Anna. Willow was taken aback. Chapter 11. Sarah kept her word. In the third month of my time with Daniel, she hired a gentle aunt to take care of him. Out of habit, I helped out when I could. Because having someone praising you while playing games was just too pleasant. Sarah often cooked for me. Maybe it was a habit from her profession as a doctor. She would debone fish before cooking it or remove bones from meat before boiling it. But it tasted quite good, though I always felt a bit weird eating it. After dinner, Daniel would habitually play with magnetic blocks on the small table in the living room. We sat on the sofa and chatted. There was an inexplicable peacefulness to it. I couldn't help but ask. Daniel often calls out for his parents in his sleep. Did you do something to upset him? Making him cry in his dreams? Sarah said softly. Daniel's parents passed away in an accident last year. Daniel needs time to adjust. I was stunned. Then who are you? A human trafficker. Sarah couldn't help but laugh. What are you thinking? I'm his biological aunt. After my brother passed away, I adopted him and raised him as my son. To avoid people's strange looks outside, I patted her. You're really kind. Sarah suddenly leaned in close. Her legs almost pressed against my hand. I instinctively withdrew my hand. But when I looked up, I met her bright, almond-shaped eyes which made my heart race. I could even smell her faint fragrance. She said, George, do you think a single mom like me can find a man who likes her? Of course, you can. You're beautiful, gentle, and kind-hearted. Do you like me? Me. I was speechless. The conversation had shifted too quickly. I instinctively said, why not? Sarah shook her head. Men shouldn't say they can't. I sighed and continued. In three years, I have to go back home. Sarah's smile faded. She looked a bit forlorn. George, can't you forget your ex-wife? I laughed. How could I? She's getting married. Sarah's eyelashes fluttered, and her eyes brightened. Her voice was filled with unconcealed excitement. Really? Should I send her a big gift to congratulate her on her wedding? I was taken aback. Sarah, why are you so excited about my ex-wife getting married? You're acting like it's your ex-husband getting married. Chapter 12. Nearly half a year had passed. There was no sign of George softening up. He seemed to have left decisively and cleanly as if he had disappeared from her world. At first, Willow didn't care much, and she didn't think about George often, although Anna often stared blankly at the wooden dolls George made, but the nannies took good care of her, so she thought she really didn't like that man at all, but Makoto's hint made her inexplicably anxious. He said, Willow, if you were to choose a ring, would you like a pink diamond? Rumors spread that Willow was going to marry Makoto, she couldn't help but think. Did George hear about it? 
Would George misunderstand and never come back? Actually, Makoto was someone she had liked for a long time in her memories. Maybe childhood memories were deeply ingrained. Back then, she had just arrived at the orphanage. Thin and weak, she looked like a little kitten ready to be bullied. And she was often bullied by the kids there. One day, she was beaten badly. Makoto called the headmaster, and a group of kids scattered. Makoto handed her a piece of fruit candy with a smile. Here, it's very sweet. Yes, it was very sweet. The sweetest candy she had ever had as a child. She never doubted that Makoto was the person she loved the most. But a corner of her heart was subtly dissenting. For instance, she was inexplicably driven to visit George's place unexpectedly. She watched George, a pretty woman, and a lively little boy walk into the community with smiles. She recognized the woman, surprised, but she still held onto a sliver of hope, refusing to think about what might be happening. So, when George came out alone, she stopped him, smiling and teasing. Husband, why haven't you come home for so long? Are you secretly keeping a woman outside? Saying this, she reached out to hold George's arm. George was stunned, instinctively pushed her hand away, frowned, and said nothing. Shouldn't he be happy she came? Why didn't he take the chance she gave? Seeing his silence, Willow felt inexplicably wronged. George, if I were really done with you, I wouldn't have come back. If you still want Anna, come back yourself. Otherwise, if I accept Makoto's proposal, you won't have another chance. George's expression was as calm as when he asked for a divorce in her office half a year ago. Congratulations, Miss Lou. Thank you, Miss Lou, for going out of your way to personally invite me to the wedding. Willow felt a strange pain in her heart. A fire of anger instantly ignited. Her face turned red, and she said without thinking. George, do you think you've struck gold? Chapter 13. I was taken aback. What do you mean? Willow sneered. The young lady of the South City U family, Sarah Yu. When she mentioned it, I remembered that the Yu family had often caused trouble for the Lu family, using their political background to create issues. Half of the disputes our legal department handled were due to Yu's machinations. She continued. Sarah may appear to be a small doctor, but she is actually the daughter of the Yu family. Do you think she would marry a divorced man like you? I frowned. So what if I'm divorced? Aren't you divorced too? Isn't your dear brother Makoto also divorced? Does that stop you from chasing after him? Willow, I know how your family has always viewed me, but look at yourself. Married and thinking about other men. Divorced and seeking your ex-husband. Do you still fantasize that you're some pure maiden saving herself for her first love? Do you think you're a princess everyone has to adore? Even after divorce? Do you think I should still be devoted to you? Willow, I need to ask you. Do you think you've struck gold? Do you think Makoto is the light of your life? Go back and check. You might not even know what disease you've caught. You and Makoto are actually a perfect match. Willow's face turned beet red, her eyes glistening with unshed tears, and she bit her lip without speaking. I felt oddly satisfied. Ignoring her shock, I turned and left. Unexpectedly, I ran into Sarah, who had been eavesdropping for who knows how long. I cleared my throat. I'm usually very nice. Not like this. Do you believe me? Sarah nodded. I believe you. As we walked, we inexplicably exchanged a knowing smile. I asked her, why are you smiling? George, you were quite impressive with your scolding. Of course, I think you made a lot of sense. I had to admit, being praised by a beautiful woman, especially one interested in me, greatly satisfied my vanity. I quickened my pace. Sarah followed leisurely. George, the most important thing is that my marriage is my choice, unrelated to the U family. George, did you hear that? Chapter 14 a week before Willow's wedding, Anna unexpectedly came to see me with the housekeeper's accompaniment. Anna was almost eight years old. She had lost her baby fat and grown taller, looking more and more like Willow. Hi, Anna. Her eyes were slightly red. Dad, I took Anna upstairs. Did your mother agree to you coming? I knew that without Willow's permission, the housekeeper wouldn't dare to bring Anna here. Anna nodded. Dad, do you completely not want me anymore? I smiled. Dad never didn't want you. It was always you who didn't want Dad. Then why don't you come home? I sighed. I divorced your mother. And divorce means not living together. Anna turned her head, looking down at the floor. Can't you come back for me? How can you say you don't want me? Anna, why should I come back for you? Although Anna was young, she was very smart. I didn't treat her like a small child in our conversations because she understood. I once made a mistake, thinking I was doing good for others, including you and Willow. But isn't that a kind of moral coercion? I thought accompanying you was good for you but you didn't need my company. I thought not letting you eat candy was good for you to prevent cavities, but you didn't care about cavities. To be good to someone, you must first know what they like. If I like peaches and you give me apples, is that being good to me? It's not. Meeting the needs of others is truly being good to them, not fulfilling what I think they need. Even if one day you get cavities and regret it, 
Thinking I was good to you back then, it doesn't change the fact that when you didn't care, I wasn't good to you, so, a person must first understand what they want to understand what others want. I have to live for myself first before I can care for others, otherwise, it's just self-sacrificing sentimentalism. Compared to your interests, I now care more about my interests. What good does it do me to be good to you? Why wouldn't I be good to those who are good to me? So I won't come back because of you. If you need child support, have your mother contact my lawyer. Anna seemed to understand a bit, lowering her head in frustration and staying silent. A knock suddenly came at the door. When I opened it, a small shadow shot into my arms. Wong. Wong. I want some pear candy. Daniel saw Anna and blinked. Wong. Is this beautiful girl your daughter? I nodded with a smile. Daniel grabbed a handful of pear candy from the table and handed it to Anna. Sister. Eat this. Wong makes it really well. It's healthy and delicious. Much better than the fancy candies you buy outside. Anna took the candy and suddenly started crying. Dad. I'm sorry. I knew she remembered throwing away the candy I made with my own hands as garbage. Sometimes. Things thrown away by hand are hard to retrieve. Love. 2. Chapter 15. Willow married Makoto. The wedding was unprecedentedly grand and luxurious. Trending on South City's hot search. In the pictures. Makoto was beaming with joy. But Willow's smile was forced. Anna. Dressed in an exquisite little dress as the flower girl. Wore an expression identical to her mother's. However. The birthday wish she made when she was five finally came true. I can only say. Daughter. You must face the wishes you make yourself. Strangely enough. Willow's wedding made Sarah and Daniel the happiest. The mother and son insisted on taking me to the villa for a vacation. George. There's a beautiful starry sky over there. And we can set off fireworks. Daniel happily spun in circles. I love watching fireworks the most. Seeing Daniel gradually emerge from the shadow of losing his parents, becoming happier day by day, made me quite happy as well. Under the night sky, we ate hot pot and sliced watermelon. The stars in the sky were countless. Fireflies with their glowing tails flew around, and frogs croaked in the nearby pond. This was the kind of life I wanted. As Daniel handed me a slice of watermelon, he said, Brother Wong, your ex-wife got married. Are you sad? I nearly choked on the watermelon. Who told you to ask that? Mom didn't tell me to ask. I asked myself. Sarah's slender body trembled slightly. Brother Wong, don't be sad. You still have us. Even if that pretty sister calls someone else dad, you still have me. Can I be your son? From now on, I'll call you Brother Wong, and you can call me son. How about that? I scratched my head, thinking it didn't sound too bad. I pinched his chubby little face and said, what else do you want to say? Just say it all at once. Daniel cleared his throat like an adult. If you think having me as your son isn't enough, I'll give you my mom as your wife. This time my hand shook a bit. This kid is something else. Daniel, worried the scene wasn't awkward enough, loudly asked Sarah, who seemed busy watering the flowers but was actually pouring water all over the ground. Right, mom, can you do this job? Can you be brother Wong's wife? Sarah softly replied with a hmm, but her ears turned slightly red. Then she looked up at the sky, at Daniel, at the trees and flowers, but didn't dare look at me. Daniel jumped up happily, running around Sarah and shouting, Mom, you're my sister-in-law now, I have a dad again. Chapter 16 Happy times always seem to have an accelerator. Three years passed in a flash, to be honest. The three years after the divorce were quite enjoyable for me. The only regret I had was, why didn't I divorce Willow sooner? Host, on the third of next month, at 1600 hours, the procedure will start, stay, or leave. The system seemed surprised at my answer. Are you sure you want to leave? Chapter 17 Willow couldn't tell if she married Makoto because she liked him more or if it was to spite George. Married life was very plain. Nothing changed. Yet everything changed. She inexplicably developed a habit of going to bars and drinking until she didn't come home at night. A few glasses of strong liquor numbed her nerves and made her feel alive. Otherwise, when sober, she always felt the lingering presence of George's shadow at home. It's really strange. How can I still see George when I'm drunk? The voice was cold. Nothing like the gentle and considerate George. I'm Makoto. Of course. I'm not George. Willow. If you have George in your heart, why did you marry me? The alcohol gave her a splitting headache, making it impossible to think clearly about this question. Does she have George in her heart? No. Right. She had always been indifferent to George, thinking he was dispensable. Did she? She vaguely remembered when Makoto got married abroad. She was only slightly sad and didn't repeatedly regret why she didn't pursue him abroad sooner. But after divorcing George, it was like cutting flesh with a dull knife, never feeling a bit of pain until now, where the pain was repeatedly tearing. She also wanted a warm little home. Before, she stubbornly thought she didn't need it. Makoto, do you want a divorce? The days of constant arguing and cursing were exhausting. 
He must be tired too. It turns out not loving someone is such an exhausting thing. Makoto gritted his teeth, his eyes bloodshot, and said. Willow, you insisted on marrying me. I will never let you go even if I die. We'll just torture each other for the rest of our lives. No one should expect to have a good time. Makoto stormed out, slamming the door. Willow saw Anna across from the study, closing the door with a blank expression. Is this still a home? Like three strangers living together, she hysterically pushed the wine glass on the table to the ground, and it shattered upon impact. Broken is broken. It can't be whole again. George, I thought you would choose to stay. Chapter 18 The night before leaving, I couldn't sleep. It felt a lot like the night before my first long trip as a child. I had told Anna and Daniel about my departure. Anna's expression was indifferent. Only when I mentioned I was leaving did her eyes redden. Dad, I can't keep you here. You live for yourself first, and I respect your decision. Anna, thank you for understanding. We are, after all, father and daughter. There's no deep hatred, but we're not close either. The bond of blood can't be severed. This distant, mutual respect feels appropriate. Daniel's eyes were red from crying, yet he still tried to act magnanimous. Wong, I'm okay. If you want to go home, go ahead, but you must think of me up there. Boo hoo. I wiped his tears, speechless. You talk as if I'm gone forever. I'm just going home, buddy. Don't cry so much. Daniel pouted. My mom is also secretly crying. I paused. I hadn't seen her in over a week. I heard the hospital has been very busy, and she barely has time to sleep. I thought about it and decided to see her one last time. Chapter 19 I had never seen the hospital so chaotic. Blood splattered across the entire wall. A group of doctors and nurses rushed the patient towards the operating room. I glimpsed the patient lying down, wearing a white coat. My pupils constricted. Who was that patient? I couldn't get through, but someone told me. A middle-aged patient attacked a doctor and then jumped to his death. The doctor who was stabbed, Dr. Lin, is a person of integrity and highly skilled. It's really heartbreaking. My heart was racing. I had met Dr. Lin before. Sarah's colleague and good friend, a gentle and kind doctor. I heard a few accusing voices from some patient's family members. That Sarah is so cold-hearted. She didn't save Dr. Lin. She saved the murderer instead. Maybe she's jealous that Dr. Lin is more skilled. They didn't understand anything. Sarah isn't like that. I had no energy to argue with them. Anxiously waiting for the surgery results, the operating room doors opened. Two pieces of good news came out. Dr. Lin is saved. No life-threatening injuries. It's a medical miracle. The murderer was also saved by Sarah. I finally breathed a sigh of relief. Now I had the energy to address those ignorant family members. Do you think this is a free market, where you can buy and sell freedom? Is it up to the hospital to decide who saves whom? If the hospital refused to save the murderer, who would be responsible if he died? The hospital assigned a doctor to save him. Could the doctor refuse? If the murderer died because the doctor refused to save him, who would be responsible? It's easy for you to criticize, but why didn't you stop the doctors from saving him? Why didn't you use violence to stop them? Were you afraid of taking responsibility? Those people turned red and stayed silent. I turned around and found Sarah eavesdropping again. She looked exhausted but smiled brightly. George, thank you for defending me. Otherwise, I would have been unjustly accused. In a secluded place, she quietly asked me. You came to see me to tell me that you're not leaving tomorrow, right? I knew she was talking about leaving the system. I smiled and said. Sorry, but I am leaving tomorrow. Chapter 20 Today is Makoto's birthday and he extravagantly invited numerous young models to the villa for a lavish party. He indulged himself, surrounded by beauties, while Willow just let him be. Since she didn't care, it didn't matter to her. Yesterday, Anna told the housekeeper she was going out to see George. Willow let her go. Anna now talks more to the housekeeper than to Willow. Today, unexpectedly, Anna knocked on Willow's door. Her eyes were red, as if she had just cried. Willow frowned. Haven't I told you, girls look ugly when they cry crying yesterday and today again. Anna's voice was low. Dad is leaving today, going back to his home and never coming back. After saying this, Anna left. Willow sat there for a long time before she regained her senses. Her heart was inexplicably flustered. She felt that George was serious, that his system was taking him back. Now, she even believed he had a system. Willow grabbed the car keys from the table and rushed downstairs. Just as she opened the door, Makoto was standing outside. He walked in and slammed the door shut. He slapped Willow hard. After the slap, he grabbed Willow's face and cursed. Willow, have you ever considered my feelings? You've completely humiliated me. Thinking about your ex while with me, and thinking about me while with your ex. Have you no shame? You're really despicable. Seeing you like this makes me sick. Do you still have any semblance of a mother or wife? Who are you pretending to be so emotional for? Willow didn't retort. At this point, 
She couldn't argue back. She didn't want to think about or couldn't think about what Makoto said. She only felt a burning pain on her face. Tears welling up but refusing to fall. She felt anxious. Like time was slipping away. But Makoto stood firmly against the door. She pulled. Pushed. Shouted. And made a scene. Ruining most of her makeup. She screamed. Move. Get out of the way. Go away. But no matter what she did. She couldn't push him away. Finally. She stepped back. Standing by the window. And sneered at Makoto. Makoto. Did you ever consider my feelings with the things you did? Secretary Chen. Alicia. Sophia. You could find anyone. Why did you have to go after my friends? The next second. She pushed the window open and jumped out. There was no time left. If she didn't leave now. She felt she would go crazy. Ignoring the pain from the fall. She crawled to the car. She floored the gas pedal. Maybe this was her last hope. She hoped George could stay. But things didn't go as she wished. Speeding recklessly. She collided with an oncoming sports car at the corner. In the piercing crash. She completely lost control of the car. Her consciousness gradually faded. The airbag deployed. Blood dripped from her head. One leg was stuck under the seat. Probably useless now. This was the first time Willow cried since the divorce. Cried like a child. She knew she had no more chances. No chance to keep George. Chapter 21. Today is the day I was supposed to leave. But I didn't leave. And no one knows. I finally found Sarah and her son. Under the setting sun. Sarah stood there like a jade statue. Silently looking at the distant coastline. Her expression was lonely and sorrowful and Daniel was using the little shovel I gave him to dig in the sand. While digging, he muttered to himself. I walked closer and chuckled at what I heard. Crab, don't come and pinch me. Wong left. I thought of a hundred happy things to hold back my tears. If mom can hold back, so can I. If you pinch me and it hurts, I will cry for real. I squatted down and moved the little crabs away from the sand. Dig away, little brother. Daniel looked at me, stunned, then turned and shouted. Mom, come quick. I'm seeing things in broad daylight. I see Wong. In the sunset, Sarah slowly showed a faint smile, with a bit of redness at the corners of her eyes. Daniel, it's real. George is back. Daniel was ecstatic. Wong, you're not leaving, right? Sarah tucked her hair behind her ear. Didn't you say you were leaving today? I pointed to the cake placed aside. Today is your birthday. Can't I go out to buy a cake? Sarah's smile visibly bloomed. Daniel ran around in circles on the beach. The waves chased his little feet making joyful splashes. Sarah's eyes sparkled. Um, it wouldn't be because of us that you delayed going home, right? That wouldn't be proper. I smiled. Sarah, you're being a little pretentious coquette. Of course, it's not because of you, it's because I can't go back for now. Chapter 22. Yesterday at the hospital, the system was still grumbling. You're so fickle. Last month you said you wanted to leave, and now you want to stay. System, can you help me out? Can I use my points to save DR? Lynn's life, the system had told me that Dr. Lin originally couldn't be saved and would have died. Sure, host, but once confirmed, your points will be reset to zero, and you'll have nothing left. You won't be able to go home. It's okay, system, I'll earn more. If that's not enough, I can borrow some of your points. The system was furious. You audacious rascal. Stop thinking about using my points. I'm a stingy and selfish system. No, you're a kind system. I knew there wasn't really a three-year cooldown period. The system had made it up. The central system wouldn't set such ridiculous rules. The system wanted me to be happy more than anyone else. In that other world, I was a lonely vegetative person with no friends or family when I woke up. The system hoped I would find my happiness in this world. Even the house I live in now was found with the system's help. Host, this place is perfect. I feel like we'll both prosper living here. What would a system need to prosper? It was just trying to introduce me to people who could bring joy into my life. The system's efforts paid off and I'm grateful to it for letting me meet Sarah and her son. Chapter 23. I made a deal with the system, using all my points to save Dr. Lin's life. So, I can't leave now. When I finished saying this, Sarah suddenly froze, then threw herself into my arms. Streams of tears flowed down my neck. George, thank you. You're really, really, really great. Daniel clapped and laughed nearby. Mom, are you serious? You're such a big person, and you cry more than I do. I gently pushed her away with a smile. Yeah crying like this, are you trying to make an ocean? I laughed, and Daniel joined in, until the sunset dipped below the horizon. The three of us, bathed in the twilight glow, walked home together, our home.